Good evening, everyone. Uh, sorry for the postponement. That's uh, that's the risk of being a South African YouTuber. Unfortunately, this show was scheduled for yesterday evening, but due to uh, the blackouts that we experience here with the electricity supply, uh, my guest wasn't able to make it. But tonight he's coming through crystal clear and uh, we're going to be continuing with my culture series. Uh, tonight we're going to be talking about Rosa culture. And the interesting thing is, with all these episodes, I always get, it's not like all my guests just give me the exact same perspective. There's always different new things that I'm learning and my audience already, uh, I'm, get, get, I'm getting a lot of messages from my audience that they're enjoying it as well. So I'm going to be continuing the series. A lot of people seem to be learning from it and getting some perspectives from people that love their culture and still have a value for it. And just a disclaimer, as always, I'm not talking to people that have done their PhDs on their culture or have written academic pieces on it. I'm talking to people that just appreciate their culture that can give us some perspective into the, the daily worries and the, also the, the histories of uh, these different cultures that we're tackling. So tonight, my guest is Becky Mahlabu, and he's going to be talking, uh, he's going to be talking about what was our culture. Welcome on the show, Becky. How's it, Aaron? Thanks for having me on, and uh, hi to your viewers as well. All right, excellent. So maybe just to to start off, um, in regards to the Kosa culture, it's pretty much the the Eastern Cape is your your home field. That's pretty much mm. uh, where the the Kosa people are concentrated in regards to your cultural home and where you would find uh, most of your culture today. Uh, how did that come about? I think it was mainly because of the migration trends of my ancestors. Uh, one of the things you're going to notice is that Kwasa has a lot of clicks into it. And that's mainly because of my ancestors migrating up from South Africa down towards the east, as well as the Western Cape in the coast. And through that migration, we interacted with other types of individuals, other different cultures, such as that of the Khoisan. In fact, that's where we have adopted the clicks in our language. I believe 15% of our clicks come from the Khoisan. Uh, so there, that's where the clicks come from. In fact, I think from my favorite um, com uh, comedy comedian uh, show in SABC One when I was, was uh, very young, uh, the joke was uh, class is very similar to Zulu. It's just that every second word is, has a click or something like that. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, that is something I've picked up. Um, it's not. I, I think that's one of the misconceptions about South Africa mm -hmm. when they hear these click features in some of the languages. They think it's just an inherent part of many South African languages, but it is mm -hmm. something that, from what I've read as well, that the 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 Kosa language actually very much uh, has a strong influence in, in regards to that, uh, the clicking sounds, even the name of the language has a click in it. So I think that uh, speaks yeah. volumes. So maybe to start off, the, the place where I usually uh, start off with these types of uh, cultural conversations is that every culture has core values. I mean, without those core values and without those ideas that form the bedrock of a culture, that culture is not really going to have a distinct identity. It's not going to be really be able to be uh, be able to distinguish between that culture and others. So in regards to Kosa culture, can you tell me a bit about what are some of the core values and ideas that you would identify that form almost like the bedrock of uh, of your culture? Yeah, so under the Kosa culture, it's just a note on it is that it's very diverse. There's a lot of different cultures within the Kosa umbrella. Uh, that said, we do share uh, common values and common core values. And I think the most important one is that of a strong family unit, as well as a strong community. And I'll tell you this by giving you a little bit of background of how I grew up in the Kosa culture as well as like where I grew up essentially. I was born in Johannesburg. Um, my drive to my life was in Johannesburg. But before the uh, keyboard warriors dismiss, it, dismiss me as a city boy, I do go home to the Eastern Cape. I considered my home in the Eastern Cape because I always go there whenever we have holidays, whether it's during high school, season, uh, high school times or primary times or even university, whenever I have a break during June and December just to see my grandmother, just to see my aunts, just to see my uncles and whatnot. And when I found one of the very first things I learned as a kid is that a very strong unit, a strong family unit is a core value of Tosa culture as well as strong community. In fact, my second name is Sapo, which uh, in translation means uh, family. Uh, and if you take that with my first name, Begumuzi Sapo, it means take care of the family home. So that's, I would say that's the very key uh, core values of our culture, as well as having a strong community. 
Um, I noticed this whenever I go to the Eastern Cape, whenever I go home, El Papasi, which is a village in the Eastern Cape, uh, there's always like a great joy uh, when they see me, like this guy comes from Joburg, he comes here home, he comes to see us, and he helps us whenever there's cultural events, uh, traditional uh, processes that occurs in a particular household, you need to go there, you need to show that you are there, you need to contribute in any way that you can, whether it is like contributing, just being there, in fact, just contributing the conversation with the elderly, with the elders there, or just simply uh, chilling with your mates, same group as you and having a great chat. So mm. just to summarize, it's just basically a strong family unit as well as strong communities. Those mm. are the core values of Kosa culture. Mm. So when you go back to, you're saying now, when you go visit your, your family there in the more rural parts of the Eastern Cape, would you yeah. say your experience there proves that there is still a very vibrant uh, uh, preservation of uh, Kosa culture there in the rural areas and that it's definitely still going strong there? Oh, very much so. Very, very much so. Um, I would say one of the most things, one of the most important things that I like about my culture is that we have a very good habit of modernizing, but not losing our sense of self worth. In the sense that, uh, if you and this is a topic that we'll discuss further on the topic, but like if you look at our cultural processes, like for example, if you see men coming from Entabeni, coming from the mountain, you'd see them wearing suits right and clothing which is seen to be western but what we've done is that we've taken that and we've made it incorporated in our own culture and modernized without losing ourselves a sense our self of sense of purpose within our culture so there's definitely a vibrant Tosa culture there in fact um you barely speak any english there um it's only english is if you go to town and you need to transact with the store owner or the manager in that case but majority of the case you're just speaking Tosa. You follow Tosa cultures, customs, and whatnot. Hmm. Well, you mentioned language there, and that's actually the next thing I want to know. And how important is the Kosa language to the culture itself? Is it as I, as I've learned from my other conversations, and as someone that comes from a culture that values their language very highly within the culture, hmm. in your culture, how valuable is the is the Kosa language in regards to keeping cultural cohesion and pretty much uh, preserving the culture into the future? No, it's extraordinarily important, man. As well as like um, the key lessons that I've learned from my uncles is is the passing down of knowledge, which is done in Kosa. Uh, there's a great sense of self worth when you conversate in Kosa, when you teach um, the younger generation in Kosa and Kosa culture, the customs that we follow. You know, like these are some uh, principles that we share with other um, cultures as well, with Zulus, Afrikaners and whatnot. That is to respect your elders, uh, to do as much as you can to provide for your family, protect your family. Uh, these principles, are, are I learned them in Kosa. When I go home, when I see my grandmother, when I used to see my grandfather before he passed away, these were principles that were instilled in me um, based on my language, based on my culture. So it's very important that we have um, the Cossack language and I think if we didn't have that we'd lose certain we'd lose some of the soul within the Cossack culture uh yeah mm. and uh so when it comes to the the language being preserved and being uh being used in your daily life uh, are there many uh Kosa, uh radio stations and books and uh, reading material and well basically mediums of consumption for your language where it's still getting exposure on the airwaves and on television and etc yeah, I'm sure Bowenen is by far the the most uh, the most popular one. I I don't know its viewership numbers in in number, but I I think it's close to a million, if not more, in the Eastern Cape. That's the only radio station that really plays there. Uh, any other radio station like Kaya FM, you don't get signal unless you have DSTV. But like if you're in your car in your baki, like Mshobo Nen is definitely the radio station that most people listen to there in the Eastern Cape. Uh, as well as the news channels like SABC2, uh, especially the Cross Edition. Uh, so in certain, as well as certain primary schools and high schools in the Eastern Cape, they still they still teach in Kosa. Uh, mm -hmm. Kosa is primarily the language being taught uh, subjects like um, mathematics um, and uh, life orientation, and then English is a second language. Mm -hmm. um, so there's definitely preservation in that aspect. So we do have mediums like radios, magazines even, uh, newspapers, uh, news channels in Kosa, sort of to preserve uh, the language. 
Mm, well, that's very important. That's why I'm uh, why I'm asking because uh, when I was talking to uh, Zuzo about Zulu culture, he was also talking about the importance in KZN about the the role of radio stations and uh, the also he was talking about the um, the newspapers that they they founded as well, which also has a very rich history. So it's good to hear mm -hmm. that uh, your culture also has uh, those types of uh, language institutions. So even like the small else, stuff we do, like excuse um, me, I'll continue. Yeah, sorry, even like the small stuff we do, um, maybe it's like playing games, it's done in Kosa, um, you know, like, yeah, so there is a sense of preservation in that aspect. Um, yeah, like the small stuff, as well as like, comments, like conversations that we do, mostly I speak in Kosa when I talk to my family members, so there's preservation in that aspect as well. Mm. Yeah, well, that's uh, I think how, how how it should be in regards to preserving your language. If you start speaking English at home, uh, your language is not going to survive past the next generation. That's the sad fact. Mm -hmm. So it's very nice to hear that there's still uh, in your culture as well a very strong uh, uh, value for the, the the language aspect of it, and that it's still spoken at home. And uh, then also, so now that we've covered the the language aspects because i think that's one of the the key pillars of a culture but there's something else that's also a very strong pillar or uh, factor within a culture and that's its its symbols that's the type of imagery that you show that to an individual from that culture it immediately sparks something in their brain it's something that's yeah. almost individual from that culture would be able to recognize it it's something that's almost burned into your mind now in regards to your culture um can you do any of these types of symbols come to mind uh the first one that comes to mind is uranta which is i think in english it's the hat house i think you, that's how you described it. it's basically a cylinder house and then with um sort of grass ceiling um that's like the process, of, like when I see a household, especially here in Gauteng, I was like, ah, there's there's a closer individual like staying there. Um, so the reason why that brings me home is that every important um, traditional event is usually done in that household, whether it is a very important meeting with the elderly or it's a cultural procedure that needs to take place. It's done usually in that house setting. So that's definitely a traditional Kosa household. I've, I've so what you're saying is this building, this building style actually follows uh, Kosa people to urban areas as yeah. well. It's, it's as such yeah, a significance. Exactly. exactly. In certain households, even in my area, there is an individual that has that uh, household, uh, that certain setting and building structure and is a Kosa individual. So that's like a very strong Kosa uh, signal. That, that no, so even signal. in Joburg? Yeah, even in Joburg, even <laughs> even Joburg, can you imagine? Even Joburg. Um, mm. In fact, I think there was a time in which I went to Pretoria. I used to live in Pretoria in my primary days, and there was that house household Uranta. And I knocked. I tried to see, like, oh, where the, the closer neighbors, like they were right next to us, mm. like closer neighbors and stuff. Like, oh, let me see all these people go and greet them and stuff. Turns out they were Afrikaners, which were also cool. We also conversated. I was like, ah, oh, you know this, and then it's like, yeah, we saw this in the Eastern Cape because they have a farm in the Eastern Cape as well. So those types of households are more predominantly seen in the Eastern Cape. Uh, mm. So that would say that's a, like, a very strong indication that you come yeah. from a closer. Uh, before, so, you, uh, before you continue, uh, if anyone's curious yeah. about how those houses look, that's actually the thumbnail of this episode. Um, yeah, exactly. When, I was, thumbnail, uh, when yeah. I was looking for, a, for something to represent your culture, I actually <laughs> thought that would be the most appropriate that, from my yeah, experience. That, yeah, that's by far the most... Uh, perfect one that you've chosen actually i, I was like yeah i was like i added into the deep knowledge of class like yeah another symbol is our clothing as well umbeku, which is the clothing it's a white clothing with uh black lining at the bottom as well as our beads um that's usually worn in cases of weddings in cases of cultural events um as well as in donga which is a, really a stick um that's usually held by men um, yeah, that's those are indications that you are close. In fact, I think I have mine just under the bed. In fact, yeah, that that I just usually took from home and what and whatnot. So those are like symbols that I take with me, and um, yeah, I carry with with me everywhere I go. Essentially, not the stick, but like the symbol of it, like and the meaning of right. it. 
Right. No, well, that story that you told about when you went into that neighborhood and you saw that house and immediately your connection was, but uh, that there's a there's a cultural connection to that. I mean, yeah. that that's pretty much exactly what I described when it comes to the importance of symbols and culture. And I think. I don't think a, a culture can survive or really or thrive really if it doesn't have those core symbols that define it because i think that's that's almost like your signal that you send out to people that hey i'm here i'm i'm also part of the club um, yeah yeah so it's interesting to hear that uh what your symbols are because it, it differs from culture to culture i mean that's one of the interesting things so far with this series um from my my talks with uh with, about zulu culture about africana culture portuguese culture every one of them when i ask them is there a certain symbol that comes to mind immediately there's always something uh, there's always something that they know and this is very deeply rooted in my culture um, yeah even and, uh, like you know, cultural processes that we follow um mm. i'm sorry if i i, I cut you there like no, no, for example, the cultural process of going to the mountain, uh, you, you wear a white pigment going into the mountain, and then once you come off, it's a red pigment. Those are further symbols that you are plus an individual. Like, I think, as like, this is also done in the Western Cape, um, where I can see some of the similarities there. Like, these are closer people coming from the mountain or in the process of going into the mountain. Mm. Yeah, no, absolutely. And uh, so I had a question here from one of my Zulu listeners. Actually, he wanted to know why um, your huts have that that ocean blue color. Is there any type of connection there or that you know of? So I think it depends on the family household. It's not it's not always that you'd see that shade of blue. Like in my household, which I sent you pictures of, it's uh, more of a peach color. It's mainly due to how does the family uh, color their household? Like, which color do they prefer? Um, in my in my village, uh, El Papa, so you, there's really like a different range of colors. You'd see blue, you'd see peach, you'd see purple. It just depends on the family unit, uh, whether their main household is that of a blue shade, and then they would make Uron Dwabo, the head house, also the blue image. Or in my household, whether it's peach, therefore the Uronda would be peach as well. So it just depends on the family. Okay, so rather than a cultural connection, it has a family or a clan connection. That's, that's yeah, exactly, exactly. Hmm. Yeah, right. And um, yeah, so when it comes to these types of, uh, you're talking about going up the mountain, and uh, you, you mentioned some other some other rituals and stuff that's uh, associated with your culture as well. Um, what can you tell me about the the Kosa rites of passage? Now, I mean, this is something that every South African has uh, encountered somewhere, or either heard about it in the news, or have talked to someone that uh, knows someone that's went through it or that has done it. Um, do, can you enlighten us in any way in regards to what this entails and uh, what position it holds within your culture? Oh, a very important uh, significance in my culture. It's basically the educating of young men as well as young children. Uh, the most the most significant ones, the first one is that ukaja, which is basically introducing the children, especially from a young age, uh, to the ancestors of the family. Uh, this is by, by far the, like the best one ever, because you do nothing for two to three days, but eat meat, which is my favorite thing ever. <laughs> but the cultural significance of that is that you're being introduced to the uh, ancestors. And what happens is that they slaughter a cow and a sheep, or it could be uh, both, depending on the family and what can they can afford and whatnot. And yeah, so you introduce to the, to the ancestors and as well as the family as well. So that's, the, that's the, 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 the first one that's really quite known in mainstream. And then the second one is that of going to the mountain. Now, going to the mountain is just the procedure or rather the process of a person going from boy to man, as well as the principles of it. Uh, when you go to the mountain, you are guided to the mountain. You never go alone. You, you always have someone with you, Bambiza Ikangata, a guardian with you, always there teaching you as to what it means to be a man. Um, you know, like one of the things that I learned while I was there in the mountain is that the principles that I was taught by my mother, I must never forget them. They're very important. It's very important, like for example, that I wake up in the morning and I make tea for my mother, I make coffee for my mother. That's also defines me as a man. It means that I respect my elderly, I provide for my family, I respect my neighbors, I respect people around me. 
doesn't mean that I need to cascade them, which is a misconception that most people have. They assume that once you come down from the mountain, you certainly, you, you just re regard everything that you were as a boy, you can now be disrespect, disrespectful to other people. That's not the case. In fact, you learn respect there. Uh, like community members, this is by far like um, the most that I, like I learned about my community members uh, while, when I was there in the mountain is that they visit you, especially men, no, no women are allowed during that period, mainly due for cultural reasons. Uh, but you learn the 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 men are there, the people that went to the mountain, they guide you through there, that you're never alone. You, that's the like probably the key takeaway there is that you're never alone really as a man. You learn from other people. You take what you can from them, you take it with you going further. So yeah, those are the two most significant uh, cultural procedure, uh, procedures in my culture. Mm. And uh, yeah, specifically that second one, uh, I think the, the easiest way to sum it up is it's a, a coming of age ritual. Where, and I think yeah. this is actually something you see in, in many cultures. It, it definitely plays a very important role for the younger yeah. generation of men to kind of transition to the next stage where they are now taking over or starting to take over positions of power and leadership within the culture. So I think it, it plays yeah. definitely plays a very important role. And I can understand why um, your culture also has a very... Uh, a very reverent uh, position for it when it comes to uh, this type of ritual or this type of uh, uh, cultural institution because what it does is it's pretty much uh, again comes back to that whole theme of it it helps preserve the culture into the future and make sure that your culture produces upstanding individuals yeah like uh, like the point that i made earlier that i love about my culture is that we have this ability to modernize you will see that uh, a lot of the the men that come from the mountain they wear like Western clothing, and just to explain the significance of that is that we see people that wear ibaiki like a, a blazer to be that of a man. You're no longer wearing. Not to say there's anything wrong with like wearing like maybe like jeans and not wearing a, a blazer and whatnot. But like in in the Eastern Cape, you're seen as a man if you have like a jacket with you. If you carry yourself well, you look presentable. You yeah, you you respect other people. Those are considered man characteristics. And that's why you're being referred to as uputi instead of ikweti, which is a boy. Uh, you refer to as a man by how you carry yourself. And in fact, if you do come from the mountain and you act as if we equate in a boy, you kind of be referred to as equating because you're not carrying yourself as that of a man. You're being disrespectful to other people, most especially women. You're not carrying yourself quite well. You're not taking care of your family. Uh, those are seen as a negative in my culture. Hmm. Right. And uh, I think now that we've covered language, we've covered uh, symbols and we've covered some rituals, there's something else that I think really uh is you can't uh, take it away from any culture it would pretty much mean the the making that culture poorer in regards to its quality and the, its robustness mm -hmm. and that's the the heroes of that culture every culture needs role models and people that the culture reveres as these are the types of men and women that you need to uh, try to emulate to the best of your uh, mm -hmm. ability um are there any cause our heroes that come to mind specifically Oh man, I'm gonna be cliche with this one. Uh, please forgive me, Adams. <laughs> I'm gonna be very cliche with this one. Uh, I would say the first one would be that of Nelson Mandela. Nelson Mandela has a huge significance where I come from. Um, I remember the time, in fact, I'll just go back to his passing and then go back previously into early years of his leadership. I remember the sorrow that I saw in most uh, elderly folks that I that in the Eastern Cape, my uncles and whatnot, when he was in the hospital, uh, there was great sadness in there because of the greatness that he, his presence had. Not only that, but like the significant impact that it had on the people there in terms of their ability to find employment. Uh, so the significance of Nelson Mandela for a lot of people in Eastern Cape is that they saw that this was a way in which they could be liberated. They were no longer uh, restraint as to where they should work or where they should not work. They could find employment wherever they want. They could learn whatever they want and whatnot. They could find, uh, they could provide uh, for their families by getting employment and whatnot. Um, so definitely Nelson Mandela. And I think the second one would be that of Steve Biko for me. Steve Biko, 
I've just so Steve Biko is actually I've just really started to read up on him. This is just my personal one. And with Steve Biko, what I liked about him was he, he's basically his opinions of 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 black individuals to think for themselves. Essentially, if I can sum it up, was I think his black consciousness movement currently is has been co-opted. I, I don't believe it means the same way as what he meant in a, during the time in which he was alive. Um, I think if I can take the principles from his he, from learning from him is that you need to think as an individual. You need to think for yourself as well as for your family. Uh, sure, there are certain things that I don't like about him, but that's with every other leader. But majority of the stuff that he said resonates with me. And I would say probably another leader that I, I have great respect with would be Tabo Mbegi, uh, mainly because of also like the major accomplishments that he has done for a lot of people in South Africa. But of course, there are also those uh, negatives with him as well. Hmm. And uh, maybe just a, a final question there in regards to now that you've mentioned Nelson Mandela, what was the the significance in the bigger picture of the your the the Kosa's relationship to other cultures in South Africa of having uh, the the president uh, in 1994 being uh, a, a Kosa man? Uh, what did that do for your culture in regards to your uh, your your the other cultures in South Africa's view of you and your your own sense of prestige? That was a huge prestige, man. <laughs> so I was, I was very young, but I, I do remember the stories that my mother would tell of the struggles of Nelson Mandela, but as well as like many other ANC officials and other uh, um, political leaders outside that of the ANC that were fighting against apartheid and whatnot. But it's a, it's a huge prestige. We have a great sense of pride in our, in our, in our culture, and I think this is quite true for other cultures as well. Uh, another example of this is that if you watch Black Panther, I know a lot of people would hate it, and I do also have some disagreements with it. I, I don't think it makes any economic sense. Mm -hmm. But anyway, <laughs> but anyway, uh, the language spoken in that movie is Tosa. And I remember at home watching that movie, like, ah, oh, they're speaking Tosa, even though they're speaking quite uh, bad Tosa. Uh, it's still Tosa, like uh, the, the clothing there is Tosa, the actors, John Ghani is Tosa, the sign, the early sign is Tosa. I was like, there's a great pride in that, like we've made it, like our culture is there. We are essentially international. I mean, geez, I, if you go overseas, the, the main figure people know is Nelson Mandela. Mm -hmm. And I wish they also do know other political figures, but like the most recognized, internationally recognized uh, individual in South Africa is that of Nelson Mandela. And that carries a huge pride for our culture. Mm. No, well, that's very interesting. But uh, your cultural hero that comes to mind is not uh, some hero from hundreds of years ago, but something more contemporary. That's actually yeah. very insightful. Um, now, something that goes with heroes <clears throat> uh, is definitely the, the legends and stories and myths. And these things also form part of a culture's texture and a part of its identity. In the Koza culture, is there like a, a prominent myth or a prominent legend that you hear as a child or that your parents tell you that's definitely unique to the culture? <laughs> so it's definitely Amapere. Uh, Amapere is like, uh, if you can think about it, it's karma. Um, like how my mother used to describe it when I was a kid is that Amapere would eat you alive if you disrespect your your, your elders. They'll punish you if you don't make your bed, uh, if you don't uh, make coffee for your mother in the morning, if you don't respect your neighbors. Uh, those are the legends that I was told. And I was really afraid because I believed in that. Like <laughs> uh, the, the description of them, I think, were like as many men. And in other cultures, they'll say, I'm a dokolosh and whatnot. But like they described as like many men, they'll come for you uh, whenever you disrespect your mother or father. Mm. And uh, yeah, and punish you essentially. <laughs> yeah, those are the legends. I, my family wasn't huge on telling, um, particularly um, legends and folk tales. Uh, so I mostly read up upon that. I think also there was a book that Nelson Mandela um, said was his favorite story, and that was the one of the seven, seven snakes, seven the snake with seven heads. I mean, mm. uh, I think this was a bedtime story, which was. 
I think one of Nelson Mandela's favorite bedtime stories. I can't remember the exact hmm. the exact uh, 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 passage or, or story of it, but essentially, I think this was a snake that used to terrorize kids at night or something like that. Yeah. Hmm. <laughs> I've been uh, outside of the the world of myth. Um, are there any big historical events in your culture that you definitely look back on and almost like celebrate, or uh, that you are told that you never should forget? Ooh. ones that make like um so are you referring to the ones that are historic the ones that are on history books and whatnot mm. yeah like a to... historic battle or a historic victory for the culture for example in africana culture would be the great trick um yeah like mm. wow what would be that's actually a very good question what would be one of our most significant historical moments Man, honestly, like it's honestly the liberation of of a lot of Tosa individuals in the Eastern Cape. I know I'm I'm repeating myself here, but I would say that's the most that's mostly the, the most historic one because I could just explain to like the significance of this. Like after 1994, a lot of Tosa family households in the Eastern Cape were given the opportunity to provide for their families and could get like could get livestock for the families. One of the most important things that I learned from my uncles is the actions that you take today impact your future decisions tomorrow. And this was explained to me by literally, my uncle set me down as well as my grandfather set me down and they made me look at the kettle that they owned and told me that it's very important that you have some form of savings. This was essentially what they were saying, that you have some form of savings so that you provide for your future generations. And they told me that they couldn't get that previously before 1994 until the liberation of, of the people and fellow South Africans, basically. I, I would say that's the most significant thing that we hold. Hmm. No, that's very interesting. Um, and that's why I like these types of conversations, because for example, um, when I talk to, for example, uh, Nzuzo, of the, uh, the, the, my Zulu guest from a few months ago, I thought, oh, no, it was yeah. last year. Um, when you ask a Zulu man of the uh, the big uh, historic events, it's something a bit far back in the in the past. But if you ask, for example, you from a Kosa background, it's a bit more contemporary. Mm. I find that very interesting. I think that's that's what I love about these conversations. Get you because you get these interesting angles that I didn't expect. Um, yeah, so the Zulu, the Zulu individuals have have an interesting history. I'm I'm also quite jealous of them. Uh, mm -hmm. A, a big flex for them is that they beat the English as well. Uh, Shiro Zulu was a great strategist uh, with a, with his whole hon, hones, sorry, ho, technique where he yeah. would fool the British front in the front, but not see that the people coming from the sides as well. That's like some smart stuff right there, mm. smart strategic um, tactics. Yeah, and revolutionizing their weaponry and everything. But now that you mention it, uh, I had a question here earlier from someone in the audience. Uh, Maluri Hanyane asks, is it true that the Koza culture is a break off from the Zulu culture? Yeah, so there is a bit of history be, um, behind that. I think, I can't remember, I can't exactly recall the exact years, but there was, so the Tosa, Tosa culture falls under the Nguni, which is part of the Zulu culture as well. But then it separated from Zululand and was and some of the tribes was uh, essentially cast out by the Zulu king uh, during those times. So we do share similarities, especially mo most, most obvious one is that with the language. Our language is by far the most similar one. In fact, if you can, if you can take a closer from Eastern Cape, and a Zulu from KwaZulu Natal, they would understand each other almost 100%. It's just that the plus individual has more clicks. Mm. But so, yeah, for yeah, those so of, you'd be able to to cover the basics when it comes to speaking to a Zulu individual. Exactly, exactly. you'd be able to cover the basics. Um, yeah, like like my all my cousins that grew up in the Eastern Cape fit right in in Johannesburg with their Zulu friends mm. and whatnot because. Like it's almost a, it's a similar language essentially. Hmm. I see an interesting piece of history here in the chat. Uh, Sideliner opinion says that 
the Koza were invo involved in eight or nine wars with the British on their border with Makana and other famous leaders. Well, that's very yeah. interesting. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah. Isn't that one of the leaders that Makana, that one of these towns in the Eastern Cape is now named after? I could be mistaken. I think it is. Um, I'm not quite familiar with the towns, unfortunately, but I think you mm. might be right there. Yeah. Mm. Um, so when you grew up in a, in a Koza household, uh, was it significant, significantly defined by your culture? And uh, what was that experience like? Now, I'm not uh, expecting of you to really give a complete timeline of your entire childhood, but what, uh, what was it like growing up in a, in a household infused with your specific culture? The most amazing thing ever. Uh, uh, so I would go home in June holidays or and December holidays, and I'd look forward to it every single time. Um, I would also look for, uh, what I didn't like was the drive to it. It would take like eight hours to get there. I just hated it. But it was definitely worth the eight hours, um, mainly because of the friends that I have there, my family is there, and the lessons that I learned from my family, which I've mentioned earlier on. But, you know, there's very important, like, I, f I feel a sense of fulfillment whenever I'm home, uh, that I'm with my family and my family is there to support me morally as well as if, if there's an, any uh, important issue happening in my life financially as well when I was in high school and whatnot, as well as, like, the elderly, the elderly, they're always comforting. They're always uh, approachable. Whenever I have a serious problem that I need to talk to, talk to them about, they always guide me through the process because they've been, they've seen that when they were in their childhood as well. They've experienced some level of that when they were kids as well. And the most thing that I was stressed about when I was young was really like education. Education was by far the most um, important thing that my family stressed in the sense that you need to go to, you need to get a degree you need in order to enable you to provide for your family in order for you to be independent. So my family, and my culture has huge significance in my actions today. Hmm. And uh, in regards to uh, that uh, cultural influence, even till today, so you would say it definitely enriched your your life and made it unique and gave you a, a, a very interesting flavor in otherwise a very diverse country. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, but even so, like I will say that as much as I learned, what I know now is what I learned from my culture, I do share similarities with other uh, cultures as well, like Zulu, as well as Afrikaners, with some of my friends, Tosa culture is beautiful. Thank you, Kat. <laughs> I, I agree with you 100%. <laughs> yeah, like there's a lot of similarities with a lot of uh, a lot of South African cultures, um, especially the, the core values like family, uh, communities, and whatnot. So, as much as we are very much different on you're talking about the cultural practices that we practice, the languages that we speak, there are similar core values that we share. Mm. And uh, now that I mentioned uh, the, the country at large, uh, the thing about South Africa is you've got all these different cultures interacting with each other. They've got shared history. Some cultures have a lot more uh, interacting with each other than others. Um, what are your culture's relationships to other cultures like? Specifically, I know there's a history that you have with the, the Zulu nation, but that goes far back. But now yeah. in modern times, uh, more specifically, what's the, what's the relationship like between your culture and some of the others? Are there some that you particularly get along with well or some that you might see a little bit of friction between? Um, the ones that we particularly uh, get along quite well or have similarities is that with the Sutu culture. Um, I think in certain Sutu villages, they also do practice the the coming of age uh, rituals. And that's where we, we, we share similarities with. And it's actually like the language is quite different from our language, but the practices that they follow, we also share a similarity in that. We get along with that. Um, the most obvious one is that with the Zulu, even the Afrikaner, when we speak about in terms of farming in, in the Eastern Cape, a lot of uh, Afrikaner farms trade a lot with a lot of the uh, Kosa farms, as well as some of the workers of the Afrikaners there, all that of Kosa individuals, uh, Kosa families, 
So there's a lot of trade within uh, the cultures. So there's a lot of inter-culture dependence with, between each culture. So we get along quite well there uh, in certain areas and whatnot. Yeah, so those are definitely the cultures that we, we get along quite well with. Hmm. And uh, then also um, something that I'm very that I'm very curious about that I actually wanted to ask you uh, is we've mentioned the the top brass leaders in the ANC, Tabu Mbeki, mm-hmm. Nelson Mandela being Kosa uh, uh, Men, but yeah. th- it doesn't stop there. There seems to be a very strong Kosa influence uh, in the ANC, even though the Kosa aren't really uh, the majority culture in South Africa. Do you have any insights on why that is? I wish I could provide insights into that. Um, But my general sense of it is that, you know, with, 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 with the Zulu culture, you have a king and this is quite well known as well as with the cluster culture, you have, you have chiefs in it. And I think with certain class individuals, there is a sense of leadership, even though some of that leadership is not, quite good for certain tribes of cluster culture as well as for general South Africans. But I do think they will seek uh, it's quite a, a leadership role or leadership role which is sought by cluster individuals. But I particularly don't know what's the general, uh, because I know what you're talking about. There's a lot of cluster ANC members uh, in within ANC leadership ranks, but I don't particularly know what's the, the reason behind that. Yeah, and now that you, uh, now that you mention it, um... This, I mean, the, the Zulu king uh, is a very famous figure in South Africa, and unfortunately, he passed away this year. Um, yeah. He was a very a very big figure in South African history and uh, in the present as well. But from what I understand, is there a, a Koza king, or is it is the structure of your your chiefs or your your cultural structure a bit different than the Zulu? I would say it's a little bit different than that of the Zulu. Um, in in our culture, even though they are chiefs, they they have a, a lot more insignificance where I come from. There's not much involvement of them. Uh, the people from where I'm from don't particularly pay much attention to what the chiefs do or the actions of the chiefs in fact uh, interact with us in, in, in any meaningful sense. What they decide on doing has no impact on our daily lives. So uh, yeah, there's not much significance of, of a king in, in cluster culture. And uh, you sent me a picture uh, yesterday about uh, what it looks like where you're staying currently. And one of the pictures that pictures that you sent me was one of a, a very large drum of beer. Um, can you tell me a bit more about that? Is that a, a uh, yeah. thing? Yeah. So what happened like three weeks ago? I was in I was in, I was in Papa's my home, and there was a a ritual in which we were thanking the ancestors for what we have. Ipekile. Uh, as well as like family members and whatnot. So what we do is we do like a large, my grandmother makes a large uh, beer quantity. Like that's what you saw. I think it was like, I don't know. I don't know how, how many liters that was. I think was more than 50 liters. It's like a, well, for people that yeah. don't see the picture, it's a very large bucket. Yeah, it's a very large bucket. Uh, it's a very large bucket of Mkombo, to traditional beer. Um, and yeah, that's, that's the way in which we thank our ancestors for what we have, as well as inviting uh, uh, people from uh, other communities to come and, and, and sit with us and talk with us and just really have a nice time mm. and learn from each other. Well, yeah, so from, from what I understand, this is not just some beer that you can go scoop out whenever you want. Nah. So on, what occasions, on what occasions would it be brought out? Yeah, most for mainly traditional occasions, uh, like what I've mentioned, thanking that of ancestors or that of uh, men coming from the mountain or that of children being introduced to the ancestors or just genuinely, if you want to have a community gathering, that's where you'd see that. You don't buy it from the shops at all. It needs to be made. In fact, like I don't even think you can particularly buy the seeds in any Johannesburg uh, shopping center or anything. It, it's mostly in, in Eastern Cape, especially boxer stores. Yeah. Um, mm. Yeah, no, uh, <laughs> I can say I've, I've tasted the, I know the Sutus also make a similar type of beer. I've yeah. tasted that and it's uh, it's not bad, but uh, I would, I would, not bad, I would right? like to, excuse me? 
Are you saying it's not bad? What? It's no, it's great. not bad, man. It tastes like homebrewed beer to me. <laughs> but it has a unique taste. It doesn't taste like a, a type of uh, the traditional type of beer that you would, would uh, brew. But it's. Yeah, uh, it, yeah. I didn't. I didn't dislike it. It wasn't. Uh, it wasn't bad. But it's. What's interesting about it for me was, it's. It's. It's not served in a in just in a glass. You you drink yeah. it from a like a traditional uh, cup yeah. as well. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, you, you don't you, you don't drink it from a cup at all. Yeah. Uh, you have to drink it from Ipekila, the 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 traditional cup or uh, bucket of it. Uh, and yeah, it mainly again is for cultural reasons. Um, mm. I've from I think when I just start, you you also drink it as a kid, but as a kid you have a a, a, a taste. You don't really have like a full bucket to yourself. Um, but as you get older. You can have more of a sip as well, um, but you yeah. definitely don't take it from cup. It's from a traditional bucket. Mm. Uh, Becky, we have a question from the audience. Uh, Sideliner Opinions asks, the best traditional dishes of the Koza? Uh, the best traditional dishes, Mpogoko, would be number one. You can think of Mpogoko as like um, scrambled pup. Mm. Uh, in Zula, I think they call it Chupuchu. It's basically you put like a lot of maize meal in it, and until the 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 texture becomes fluffy, so that's number one. And then the second one would be umgosho, which is samp. Uh, that's by far my favorite one. That's I think yeah, that's my favorite one. Um, yeah, those are by far the two two possible traditions that I yeah traditions that I like. Yeah. Mm. And uh, so you'd oh, say different Sorry. Hmm, my goodness, I can't believe I forgot Lucy. Lucy is basically the sheep's stomach. Mm. Have you ever tasted that out? Uh, no, I haven't, but I've, uh, yeah. in Africana culture, we have Afol, which is pretty much the same yeah. thing. Same thing, mm. yeah, yeah. Oh, and it's, yeah. it's the best. It's the best, mm. yeah. No, I haven't had it in a while. Um, what's this? I don't know how to, uh, does that sound familiar? Umoshi, umoshi. I, I'm not, I think she's asking about the dish. Mm. Mm. So mm. when it comes to these dishes that you that you described, is it uh, it seems like uh, maize plays a very large role. That's pretty much the base of most of these dishes. Would you say the, the Koza people are specifically a, a maize farming culture or are there any other types of livestock or agriculture that really also feature everywhere in your dishes? Yeah, so it's it's maize, it's cow, it's sheep, mm. it's goat, it's pig. Uh, those mm. those are the by far the main ones. Yeah, those are the main ones. Uh, yeah, in in my in my household, uh, we have we have a farm, which we inherited from our grandfather who who bought the farm. It's we plant maize. In fact, it's harvest season soon. In fact. Uh, mm. This is this bringing childhood memories. Every June, we'd go and, and have it and pluck mealy and whatnot and sell it and slot a lot of cows, uh, as well as sheep and, and goats, as well as um, pig. Yeah, so those, those are the main staples. Hmm. So, some of the, the other cultures that I've talked to, I mean, I've talked to uh, Koketso about uh, Chwana culture as well. And uh, he said that, well, he talked about the, the strong Christian influence there. And I also talked to Treasure about Tronga culture. He also talked about a strong Christian influence there. And that connects to a question that we got here from the audience. Um, Mulure asks, uh, what influence does Christianity have on the Kosa culture? These are some good questions, man. A lot of people watching this. This is actually making me quite yeah. nervous. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it has a huge influence, man. Uh, I grew up in a Christian Christian household, uh, mm. as well as like my my ex extended relatives, my friends, El Papasi. They grew up in a Christian home. Uh, in fact, I believe the first translated Bible in nine was in nineteen fifty nine. Mm. The Apostle translated Bible. There's a church in El Papasi, which is a Christian church. So there's a strong, strong, strong influence within the, the Christian, within the Kosa culture, uh, as well as our value system and whatnot. Yeah. Mm. 
Uh, and now the, the final question is what I always end these episodes on, and this is the difficult one, and that's definitely the the, the challenges and the obstacles that your, your culture faces faces today. Now, like I said at the beginning, uh, this is not a, an academic pre, uh, academic analysis of it, but you as a, a quasi man, what would you identify as some, some key challenges that your culture faces today and into the future? Whew. That's a hard question, Alex. You just had to like bash me at the end there. Um, you have to end strong, man. I'm giving you the, the yeah. opportunity. <laughs> uh, the challenges I've seen on, I've seen, well, this is not really a challenge and I'll say why it's not a challenge, but I've seen a lot of people state that the Tosa culture is very tribalistic in its uh -huh. nature. And I think I disagree with that. Um, I say this when I, with my experiences, I don't speak for every closer individual there, but when I go home, I see the importance of trading with other cultures and whatnot, um, especially with that of Afrikaner. A lot of politicians, especially, they make the narrative that it's the Afrikaner's fault that a lot of uh, closer individuals, a lot of Zulu individuals or a lot of other cultures in South Africa, particularly that of black individuals are in the area, are in, <clears throat> in the setting that they're in, it's mainly because of the Boer, which is false. When you go home and when you go to your particular household and you see the importance of trading with each other, the importance of essentially benefiting from what we can't do and what they can do in trading uh, with each other, uh, you see the, the, the importance of other cultures as well. So I would say that I turned you. I turned your last question into a positive. Actually, I just noticed that. But like, a lot of people say that the Tosa culture is very tribalistic, and I say that's that's mm -hmm. largely false. I'd say one of the strongest characteristics with each other, with our culture, is that we realize the importance of collaborating with other cultures. We realize the importance of um, modernizing, but modernizing in the sense that we keep our true self worth. Um, yeah, so I would say another challenge in that is that we need to have a lot more Tosa literature. And I don't think this is this should be particularly forced, but I'd say that we should have we should have um maybe another we should have a Tosa university. Why not? Uh, uh you know, I'd love to see as much as math is, is taught in Tosa in the Eastern Cape, but I'd love to see like economics taught in Tosa or something of that nature. Um mm. Yeah, so I would say that, yeah, that's that's my closing point on that. I hope I answered your question. <laughs> no, 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 you answered it perfectly. Uh, maybe just uh, something there that you mentioned of the being taught in Kloza, uh mathematics. To what grade is that done in the Eastern Cape? Because I don't, I don't mostly know. Done in primary. It's mostly done in primary, in primary, mm. most, most primary schools um, in the Eastern Cape. So my primary school was in Johannesburg, mm. uh, sorry, Pretoria, but... Mm. I, I used to, in June, there used to be like extra classes in primary school and they would teach mathematics in Tosa. Um, in high schools, it's it's taught in English, but like your basic numerical values, like one, two, three, and additions, subtractions, divisions, those are put in Tosa in primary schools. Um, in now in nowadays, it's slightly more, less, I mean, than it was before. Now it's mostly taught in English. But they are still are primary schools in the Eastern Cape teaching in Kosa. Mm -hmm. Even in math, in even in my matric year, now that I remember, in my winter school, my matric year when there was winter school during June, uh, some of the subjects were taught in Kosa mm -hmm. for some matric, uh, high school. Well, that's actually good to hear because uh, I'm of the not of the opinion. It's actually proven by research that's been done that uh, children learn much easier in their home language. So I think it's very important, specifically in primary school level, when you're learning about abstract things like mathematics, you don't need a second language keeping you down while you're yeah. doing it. If you can have the opportunity of being told in, uh, taught in your mother tongue about things uh, like, for example, mathematics, uh, literature, uh, just it will also help you with learning other languages if you can be taught English with uh, 
Kosa as the, the intermediary language or the language that you're transitioning to English, I think it will also do a lot of good for those students. So it's nice to hear that there's still primary education in the, the Eastern Cape being done in Kosa. It's sad to hear that it's being anglicized. I don't think that's the right direction. I think the right direction is actually empowering languages in South Africa so that everyone can be educated in their home language. That's the type of South Africa that I think uh, we rather should be moving towards. But unfortunately, the, the powers that be don't agree with me. Yeah, so I, I I agree with you on that point. A lot of people think that if you teach, well, not a lot of people, a minority of people think that if you teach children in, through university, through high school in their home language, then there's a sense of division. Well, how are they going to communicate with each other and whatnot? Mm -hmm. um, there are ways in which you can communicate with each other. Like there are ways in which a lot of people in most, the most rural of in the Eastern Cape communicate with Sutu people communicate with Afrikaner people. We find ways to communicate with each other. So I do think that there's very it there is is a, 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 it is very important for for us to to learn in our, in our home languages, um, to learn our, our our where we come from, to learn our cultural heritage and whatnot. So yeah, I agree with you on on that point. Yeah, and uh, to enforce that point, Deborah says, uh, you know, I could not even understand maths in my own language. <laughs> well, there you go. Um, Becky, I'm going to give you the opportunity now to just give us some final thoughts. Now that we've had this very enlightening conversation, I really enjoyed it. Uh, what are your, your some of your final thoughts regarding this, this uh, idea of culture, this whole theme of culture, and the ideas that we talked about tonight? What would you say is the, the some of your final thoughts there? My final thought is that of the statue in New York. Um, that is, please like, uh, correct me if I'm mistaken on, on the location of the statue. Anyway, earlier this week, there was a statue of an artist um, in New York City, which was posed and said that this is African culture. I just want to say that there's no such thing as African culture. Africa is not one country. It's, it's a country made up of very different Euro locations different um, languages, different um, thousands of uh, tribes and whatnot. And that's very true in South Africa, 11 official languages, 11 different cultures. Uh, so there's a, quite a, there's a lot of diversity in the country. Yeah. That said, we do share similarities across uh, cultures, we do share core values. I, th I think a lot of people would agree with me that every culture or every household needs to have a strong family household need to have strong communities uh, and whatnot, need to like uh, educate the kids, need education is very important, as well as respect of the elderly, as well as that of neighbors. Mm -hmm. So my clothing point is that as much as we are very much diverse, there are similarities across cultures that we can relate to. And I think that's what we've been seeing over the years. And that's why we, relations across cultures have been improving because we can see those uh, similarities and uh, partake in them. Mm. No, that's a very powerful point to end on, Becky, and I think that's why we can have conversations like this. I think it's yeah. very important to be able to have that type of uh, intercultural conversation. I think it's something that is South Africans woefully don't do enough. I think we, we could do uh, gain a lot more from uh, understanding the cultures around us, and that will firstly show us how we differ, but it will also show us how we're the same, and I think that's both yeah. are equally important. Uh, where our cultures are not all the same in regards to our, our values and our, our view of the world and our priorities. One culture might prioritize one value over another while your culture prioritizes another virtue more highly. And then you're not going to understand why this different culture doesn't, for example, take your principles as seriously as others. Um, and uh, if you don't, if, if you don't look at it through a cultural lens, that's just going to be bizarre to you and you know it's just going to lead to a lot of frustration but if you actually understand what type of values different cultures and what type of worldviews different cultures have you'll realize but yeah we're different but there are some things that we share and i need to be able to know what uh, i differ on from different uh, differ with how i differ with other cultures to be able to understand why they sometimes act bizarrely or act differently than i do or react to situations differently than me that comes yeah. a lot from uh, from the cultural influence in their life yeah, one hundred percent agree with you, man. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, uh, Becky, thank you very much for your valuable time. This was a very nice conversation, and uh, unfortunately, our viewership has peaked right at the end. Uh, I can't believe what it. What are you serious? 
no. that's uh, that's unfortunate but uh, yeah we're going to have to go both of us have uh, other yeah. things to think to well, I'm, glad I'm, gonna... I'm glad people enjoyed it i'm glad people mm. enjoyed it yeah. I'm just going to read some uh, some thoughts from the audience before we say goodbye. So sideline opinion says thank you very much, Becky and Aaron's, for bringing a part of uh, bringing a part of our culture, diverse culture, to us in such a palatable way. Um, I see Kat here says thank you. Always lovely uh, listening to each other, and I see uh, Lazar Lice says uh, cheers, friends. Your, <laughs> your, says, viewers, uh, your, your viewers are very kind. I expected mm. it to be ruthless. <laughs> mm. uh, Debra says, uh, yes, I'm uh, sorry I came in late. Uh, well, Debra, th uh, thanks to YouTube, you'll be able to watch the part that you missed afterwards on Catch Up, so that's mm. no problem at all. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. You've been an excellent audience. Uh, Becky, thank you very much. You've been an excellent guest. And uh, if you guys are interested in these types of conversations, I'm going to be talking to more individuals from other cultures in South Africa. You can click subscribe and you can also click the like button and also share this episode if you know anyone that's uh, that's interested in different cultures in South Africa. If you know a close up person that's interested in their own culture that might learn something new, uh, share this link with them and uh, they might find it very interesting. So cheers, guys. Have a good one. Becky, I hope you enjoy the rest of your evening, and everyone enjoy the last bits that's left of your weekend.